Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're asking, can we see black holes? I can't see one right now. (laughs) I'll be worried if you could. (laughs) Black holes are one of the most mysterious types of objects in space. But we're about to find out how astronomers are searching for supermassive black holes on an epic intergalactic quest. Today's question comes from our listener, James. Hi, my name is James, and I am nine years old, and I am asking a question. Why can't we see black holes? Can't we see black holes with a strong telescope? That's such a good question. I imagine it would have to do with them being black. (laughs) James has an idea about why black holes might be so hard to see. Space is black, and black holes are black. And also, can't black holes suck up anything? Well, I think they can suck up light from a star. So that is my guess. You see, James and I are on a wavelength here. (laughs) (laughs) Here's how James thinks scientists could solve the problem of detecting black holes. I think scientists could look at stars. If their light is getting sucked in, that might mean there's a black hole nearby. That is what scientists could do. Wow. So he's saying that if there's a star where we can't see as much light coming from it as we should, that could be because there's a big black hole nearby. (laughs) That's the idea. So let's ask our listeners, do you think we can see black holes with a telescope? How do you think scientists would find black holes? Think about it because we'll be back with an astronomer who's discovering a new way to find bigger and bigger black holes. To find out the answer, I sat down for an interview with astronomer Maura McLaughlin. Wow, like in person, like face to face? Yep. I was holding a microphone and asked her a very important question. Why do you think that black holes are cool is my question. Well, they're the fundamental building blocks of galaxies. Every single galaxy has a black hole at the center of it. And so these black holes were formed very early on in the, you know, very new stages of the universe when it was just like a little baby and matter has just grown around these black holes. Stars has grown, gas has grown. So they're kind of like the fundamental building blocks of everything that exists, of of us, of galaxies, of stars. Wow. So black holes are like the glue that holds us all together, like the most ancient ancestor that we share with everything in the universe. Exactly. They're kind of a big deal, but they don't like to show it or anything. That's kind of their thing. Like just not showing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They have a powerful influence, but they stay hidden. They're behind the scenes. So now that we know why black holes are cool, I asked Maura our listener's question. It's from a kid named James, and he says, why can't we see black holes? Or can we see them with a telescope? What would be your short answer to that question? A black hole has a gravitational field so strong that nothing can escape from it, not even light. So we can't see them because they don't emit anything. So James is on the right track. Like, well, at least with the first part, black holes are hard to find because they don't give off light like stars do. Yeah. And Morris says it's what we can see around the black hole that gives it away. So we see stuff swirling around it, but we can't see what is going around. And therefore, we know that they must exist, even though we can't actually see them. Does that make sense? Well, I have some follow-up questions. What do you use to detect them? So there's a huge black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So right now, we are orbiting a black hole that weighs 4 million times as much as the sun. And we can tell how big that thing is by how fast all the stars are moving around it. Wow, so our whole galaxy is basically organized just around one big black hole. So that must mean that they're, like, kind of important for our existence. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it does. So what we can learn about black holes from telescopes that see with light is limited. But fortunately, astronomers recently found a much better way to detect black holes. So it's all been based on like indirect evidence up until about eight years ago when black holes were more directly detected, I would say, by the LIGO Gravitational Wave Telescope. So wait, what's LIGO? Is it like a off-brand Lego? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what that has to do with black holes. <laughs> LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So I guess WAVE doesn't get to be in the acronym. <laughs> no, it's gravitational dash wave. So <laughs> it just wouldn't be like like whoa. Like whoa would like be hard whoa. to pronounce. They're like, let's just take the W out. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it's a type of telescope that doesn't detect light. Instead, it uses laser beams to find something called gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves created a whole new chapter for black hole discovery. Ooh, okay. So I want to know all about that. But first, I've got to know... And so do our listeners. What is a gravitational wave? Well, here's how Mora describes it. These gravitational waves are ripples in space-time emitted by these very, very massive black holes. Hold on. What are ripples in space-time? This sounds complex. <laughs> yes. Here's an easy way to think about it, or at least easier. Imagine you've just thrown a rock into a quiet pond... That causes ripples or small waves to spread across the water. Gravitational waves are just like those ripples, but they move through space. So the ripples are a sign that the black hole is there. Yeah, it's like they're reflecting off the black hole. And by looking at the gravitational waves, astronomers can take much better measurements of black holes than they could before. Okay, well, so what do we do with all that? Well, it means astronomers are now setting off on an intergalactic quest to discover even more black holes and uncover even more secrets behind the formation of the universe. And we'll find out how right after this quick break and message for grown-ups. Okay, we're back. So when we left off, our minds were blown by ripples in space-time called gravitational waves. A telescope called LIGO discovered that they existed for the first time back in 2016. And now, Mora's team of astronomers has found the mother load. So in June, we announced the discovery of something called the background of gravitational waves. And what we mean by that is basically the combined signal of all of the gravitational wave sources in the universe. <laughs> Wait, what? All of the gravitational waves? Yeah, you can think of it like the background noise of black holes. But we see the combined noise of all of them in our data, and we call that a background of gravitational waves. Is that noise that you can, like, actually hear? Like, if you just take off your headphones, you're like, oh, there's a black hole. <laughs> no, not really. These are really low frequencies, like much lower than sound frequencies. But you can think of it as like, you know, if it was in an orchestra, it would be the bass note. <laughs> so Mora, along with a huge team of astronomers, are searching for hidden sounds or patterns within this cosmic orchestra. What they're listening for is the sound of supermassive black holes. Can you tell me what is a supermassive black hole? So when we talk about supermassive black holes, we're generally talking about black holes with masses something like a billion times the mass of the sun. So, you know, I don't exactly have a PhD in astronomy. Not but exactly. if there's one thing I've learned, the sun is large. <laughs> <laughs> so a billion times the size of the sun would be... Um, Big. Yeah, and when Mora uses the word massive, she's not just meaning like big, big. Scientifically, massive refers to an object that has a lot of mass or physical matter in it. So I didn't know that there were like more than one kind of black hole. I thought they were all just black. Me either. Why do they exist? Like, why are there different sizes of black holes? 
Yeah, so these supermassive black holes um, live at the cores, at the centers of galaxies. And we think they got so big from galaxies merging with other galaxies. I mean, I guess I didn't know that black holes could merge with other black holes. It's really amazing. The universe is amazing. Yeah, the theory is that the first galaxies in the universe were pretty small. Like, you know, if you're just getting a town started for the first time. <laughs> it's couple like the of beginning of the SimCity game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they've grown by merging with other galaxies nearby, causing their black holes to combine and grow too. So we think galaxies like the Milky Way even were formed from smaller galaxies merging. So what we're doing with our nanograph experiment is trying to detect pairs of these supermassive black holes sitting at the centers of galaxies. Mora is helping to lead this nanograv experiment, which collects data on gravitational waves over a long period of time. And its goal is to find these supermassive black holes that may be just about to merge. And if we detect them, then we can study how this process of galaxies merging together happened. Like, how long does it take? How many galaxies have merged throughout cosmic time? Well, so it's like trying to find the biggest collision about to happen in the universe. Yeah, it's like crash course galaxy. <laughs> They're going to start orbiting each other faster and faster and faster. And eventually, they're going to collide. They're going to merge into a single, even bigger black hole. And this is what we call this, this death spiral. Well, a supermassive black hole death spiral. <laughs> that sounds both dramatic and like it would be a great name for a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I wanted to know what happens after that and what it's called. So what is it called when two supermassive black holes get together? Is it like a super, supermassive black hole? <laughs> I just call it like an even more massive, supermassive black hole. Really? <laughs> super is already as big as we go. So, super. Yeah. Super, <laughs> super massive. <laughs> Maybe we need like an extremely super massive black hole. So there are terms for this stuff that like haven't even been invented yet. Could we like get more to call them a shaboinga boing? <laughs> So I don't think she's going to go for that. Come on, Mora. <laughs> I think it's super shaboing a boing. <laughs> Just think how awesome that would be. <laughs> if I can leave my mark on science, let it be this. <laughs> Anyhow, what we're calling a supermassive black hole binary dust spiral hasn't been found yet, which leads us back to the rumble of gravitational waves. Let's think back to our cosmic symphony. Like right now, all we hear is the noise, but soon we'll hear like an oboe start to like just come out, you know, above the noise at a particular frequency and we'll be able to say, oh, there's you know, a particular binary in that direction, you know, in that particular galaxy and not just like the noise. Okay, so we're just like searching for the sound of an oboe in a distant galaxy, an alien oboist. <laughs> <laughs> I love that image. <laughs> <laughs> Would they even have lips to be able to play a double read? <laughs> we're not actually looking for an intergalactic oboe, but it's incredible that within all of this noise, eventually black holes will start to stick out and those waves will guide the way to the first supermassive black hole binary. So they haven't found one yet? Yeah, so we haven't found an individual one yet, um, but the discovery of this background was pretty exciting. It took 15 years to gather enough data to search through and find the patterns that revealed this background. And when we finally looked at our 15-year data set and saw this telltale pattern uh, that told us these were gravitational waves, that was a, a really exciting moment because we had been working so hard for so long <laughs> to do this. It took 15 years? Yeah, not exactly overnight. So I wanted to know what that moment of discovery felt like. What do you do? Do you jump up and down or <laughs> like when you realize like this is a really big finding, like yeah. what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I remember being at an American Astronomical Society meeting about three years ago. 
Mora was at a big meeting for astronomers, and she happened to see another astronomer who was working on the experiment. He showed her a graph of the data that finally revealed the pattern they'd been searching for for years. And I think I jumped up and down, and I probably hugged him. So it was, like, really exciting because we've been working towards this for so, so, so long. And that moment was 15 years in the making. So my last question was about what keeps Mora going on all the days in between. And what keeps you excited? I mean, honestly, for me, a lot of it is the possibility of huge surprises. She told me that astronomy is full of discoveries that no one predicted, but just appeared when astronomers had discovered a new way of observing the universe, just like now with gravitational waves. We're going to find some expected stuff, like these supermassive black hole binary signals, but I also think there might be some totally unexpected things that are going to pop up in our data, and to me, that's the most exciting bit just like the possibility of completely new phenomenon and things that just like we never thought of before. And so it's like we can imagine what we might find, but there are things that we can't even imagine that we might find too, like a massive alien playing a nobo (laughs) sitting on a black hole. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever it is, I'm sure it will be super massively exciting. Now that you've learned about how astronomers are searching for supermassive black holes, it's time to set off on your own epic intergalactic quest in your imagination. Come up with your own ideas for what might exist in the vast unknown of the universe and figure out how you would search for it. Anything goes. Get creative and write a story, draw a comic, make some art, or whatever else you can think of. And let us know what you create. Email us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to see it. Thanks to Maura McLaughlin, professor of physics and astronomy at West Virginia University and co-director of the Nanograv Physics Frontier Center. Our interview was recorded at the AAAS conference in February 2024. Special thanks to James for his question. Hear more from Maura McLaughlin about cool things like black holes and pulsar stars on our bonus interview episode, available when you support us on Patreon for just $1 or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Learn more about Maura's work and gravitational waves on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our editor and designed the episode art. Elliot Hajaj is our production assistant. Gary Calhoun James engineered and mixed this episode. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all of the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.